Welcome to Globe Watch with me, Charles Ebune. A candle in the wind or a perplexed situation. That is the best way to describe the global economy today. And the reasons are not lacking. One, the climate crisis. Two, the COVID crisis. And three, the crisis in Eastern Europe today. The entire global economic outlook has been redefined by those three factors with the latest one being one of the greatest challenge to a food crisis which was already increasing as prices rise all over the world. What will be the best economic engine to apply in such circumstances, especially for emerging markets like those in Africa? My guest today on Globe Watch is a senior economist at the International Monetary Fund. Dr. Christian Ebeke, welcome to Global Watch. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. I presume that for the past two years in which we have been living the COVID-19 crisis, plus the crisis in Eastern Europe today, one thing which is constant about you personally is that your salary possibly has not increased nor diminished. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a case for most of families. I mean, um, in most of countries, um, you know, income of the poorest did not really increase um, because of the pandemic, people lost their jobs. Um, so maybe salary has not increased um, for people like me. I'm fortunate to still have a job, but for many people around the world, they actually lost income because they became unemployed. Sure, your salary has not increased and has not diminished, but I am sure that as you move around the world, one thing that you have seen fluctuating is the instability in prices. Sure, right? Yes, completely. And this predates actually the current um, conflicts in, in Eastern Europe. I mean, during the pandemic, because of global supply chain um, shortages, um, you know, the provision of certain basic items uh, were compromised and um, that created you know a, s a situation where global supply was actually limited because of both the bottlenecks in supply chains at the same time you see high demand so when you have an imbalance between supply and demand what is going to happen is that prices are going to go up so even during the pandemic um, there were already a lot of so shortages of certain key items for, for household now with the with the conflict in, in Eastern Europe, I mean, people have to understand very key statistics. Um, Russia and Ukraine account for one third of global trade of cereals and wet. So when you have um, a conflict like this one, spillovers in, into smaller countries like Cameroon are immediate because we are an open economy. We rely a lot on imports of those food products. At the same time, energy prices are going up. You can see around the world, in the US, in Europe, in Africa, in countries where you have uh, flexible uh, oil prices at the pump, you can see that energy costs are rising. And this is, these two items, food and energy, are the key item in household budgets. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll come into the nitty gritties in a moment, but let's just unpack a few issues together yeah. concerning the pandemic itself, sure. uh, COVID-19. Uh, World Bank and IMF estimates uh, 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 rolled out that at least $80 billion of the global economy were lost daily. Yeah. Just explain to me how did that disrupt the supply chain in uh, regular market provisions? Let me first, when we talk about the pandemic, let me first, you know, acknowledge, first of all, the human losses, right? I mean, a lot of people lost their lives because of the pandemic. Plus 5 million people. Exactly. And still Plus continue. Plus 200 million others were infected. Ex exactly. So that's why you have to take everything in perspective. And that's also why governments decide to deploy massive support. I mean, in countries that had fiscal space, had, they had the means to, to help their population, they deploy a lot. Regarding your specific questions about uh, supply chain disruptions, you have to understand that the world economy has moved into very sophisticated form of production. We call it decentralized production. So if you're producing a bicycle, the wheel of the bicycle will come from Indonesia. The other parts of the bicycle can come from China. And even for the wheel, some part can come from countries like Nigeria or Ghana. 
So because of the uh, decentralization of production sites and the fact that these supply chains are very rapid now. Interconnections. Yeah, exactly. We call it just-in-time supply chain, meaning if you just have one shock in one part of the supply chain, the whole system is completely corrupt. So this led to massive shortages of key item manufacturing goods. You can even see how at the beginning of the pandemic, people were running um, into airport to get because masks. Of the block, e exactly. Of the lockdowns, which exactly. Were imposed. And the lockdowns the were The maritime imposed. space, the airspace, exactly. and even the terrestrial space. Exactly. If you look at some statistics for Cameroon, the increase in freight cost, right, just to import goods, the freight cost, the transport, and the, the containers, the increase is 270%, you know, over the past two years. So if you're an importer and you have to bring some goods in Cameroon, you're facing huge transportation costs because of these um, lockdowns, because of this uh, disruption in supply chains. One key fallout has been uh, the avalanche, the increase in, 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 in farming in particular. The World Food Programme says that since 2019, roughly 29 million people were suffering from famine in the world um, as where we are today it's um, 44 million people you can add the other 820 million already suffering from hunger how much of a damage was COVID in particular to the global food market the damage was very very strong and very deep and the reasons are that in the countries where you have massive production of, of things like rice um, in, in, Eastern, in East Asia. You know, the lockdowns prevented, for example, export of, of these items abroad because the ports were not running 100%. Uh, transportation in was... Major production in major production like, production, exactly. uh, like Thailand, exactly. China. Exactly. That's why you had these shortages in, in, in terms of uh, the, the supply of, of, of some food products. In, in, in Africa, it was also the same. Right. I mean, I, I recall certain stories about Cameroon, where because of the blockades, uh, the border between Cameroon and some neighboring countries, you know, the tomato crisis happened for a few weeks here in Cameroon, mm -hmm. where um, the farmers could not actually export their tomatoes, and the price of tomatoes in Yaoundé and Douala dropped significantly. Mm -hmm. This has direct consequences for farmers because they're losing income mm -hmm. and they have invested um, actually to, to grow the tomatoes. So this is, is very... Um, Telling. Let's look at the other key factor which has reset somehow the global economic mantle today and it's the crisis in Eastern Europe between Russia and Ukraine. The Black Sea where the entire uh, dispute is taking place controls around 3% of global maritime trade. To that can be added the Iranian Strait of Hormuz which controls about 30% of the global uh, maritime trade. Um, as you indicated somewhere in the interview, these are countries that control about one third of the global uh, wheat production. Yes. Who bears the brunt of all of that? The whole economy, everybody. The crisis in, um, in Ukraine is creating waves that resembles what we saw during the global financial crisis of 2008. The stock markets in many countries have crashed hugely. Same thing for oil prices. For oil producing countries, it may be a boon, it's good for them, but at the same time they have to face the parallel shock, which is food prices. And in most of our countries in Africa, what we have done over the past 30 years is actually shifting away from primary sector, from agriculture, to quickly embrace the service sector. So we forgot that our bread and butter is really agriculture. This is where we have a comparative advantage. How come, Charles, that we are importing right now things that we used to make 20 years ago? How come that we're so dependent on rice? Rice is not even our habit. We're not used to eat rice 50 years ago. Where are the products that we use to eat ourselves? Where are the things that we use to pro produce? The rural urban migration that you see in many countries is huge, is massive, is destroying our agriculture. It's very important right now in the face of this conflict to rethink our strategy. Our strategy has to be centered around the things where we have comparative advantage. This is basic macroeconomics. This is coming from Ricardo centuries ago, right? We have to come back to 
what can we do best? Where do we have comparative advantage? The conflict is creating a lot of pressures on governments, right? Because in many countries, the social um, situation is not easy. Um, you have uh, demographic pressure. You have young people that are more vocal now. You have social media. People are demanding things from government more forcefully than ever before. So governments right now need to think carefully about how best to support the economy, how best to support the private sector or household within the budget, that, that, the that, limits. <coughs> that will entail redirecting and re-injecting resources to certain areas to maintain the social fabric of the economy, of normal, ordinary life. The African Development Bank uh, estimates that for countries like Cameroon, um, Egypt, Sudan, with a plus 60% importation of wheat from Russia, we usually, usually be impacted. And they are meeting in the course of this week um, African agricultural ministers to strategize on the fund of roughly 1 billion US dollars. Would that be enough to withstand the shocks? I'm going to give you an example. In the Waimo in Western Africa, um, they have a mechanism for cereals that they call strategic inventories, right? So at the regional level, they pull together cereals in some, in some places and that they can then use and distribute when there is a shock. The they keep them in warehouses yes, in West Africa? Yes, exactly. In the region, it's a regional initiative, mm -hmm. right? Cur right now, they have 30,000 tons of cereals available in stocks, in the inventories. The needs are 400,000 tons, and this is, it is only for two or three days, okay? So right now, when you even look at the scheme that some African countries have developed, they are under provision, right? They don't have the, the capacity to actually respond to this shock if this shock becomes protracted. The uncertainty that we face right now is we don't know if this shock is permanent, or at least it's gonna last for 12 months, or it's gonna end tomorrow. This big uncertainty is also creating a lot of difficulty for policymakers because they really don't know if they have to go big in terms of supporting or they have to go through the instability and maybe um, um, escape it later if the shock um, ends quickly, qu quicker than, than we expect. Usually when you have a term of trade shocks like this, because this is how we call it, it's a term of trade shock, you have to ask yourself, how can you engage with the private sector so that there is a dialogue in how best we should handle the situation. And I think the government in Cameroon, from what I understand, is doing that. There are discussions with the private sector in this regard. It, it is the only way, because at some point, either the government bears the cost, right? But when you have a challenging fiscal situation, when you have treasury tension, it's very difficult to actually support the economy like that, especially if the shock is protracted. Or the private sector will be at the cost, meaning they will see shrinking profit margins. But again, you have to see if this is sustainable for them. Can they really do it? Or it's going to be the consumer, consumers at, at the end who are going to bear the cost. But again, have they seen their disposable income rising over the past three years? Do they have savings that they can use to cope with this shock? These are all questions that I think are keeping our policymakers in, in, awake. In the African market, the shock is mostly nutritional but yes. when you go to the western uh marketplace is mostly about energy uh, gas petrol gas oil it seems to me that each economic reality must cross check itself i mean your analysis is is, is outstanding um, you said that for africa most of the shock looks like a nutritional shock, it's a food price shock, and in other countries, more advanced, it's more like an energy shock. But for Africa as well, given the key role of our agricultural sector, most of the nutrients, right, most of the, the things that you import actually for your agriculture are derivatives of oil. So when oil prices go up, Everything else that you need for agriculture as input is also going up. The consequences for 
our agriculture, the consequences for the purchasing power of people, because these two items in the consumption basket dominate everything. If you put aside um, rent, housing rent, food and energy affects everything, affects your mood, it affects how best you can travel, transport, everything, everything else. So it's, it's very, very important that this situation that we see in Eastern Europe quickly resolves and, uh, and that we can move to, to better, um, better pastures because as soon as we were thinking that the COVID crisis were slowly ending, we face now another key shock, which is this, this, this situation. It creates global uncertainty for everybody and for small countries like African countries with a high debt to GDP ratio in some cases with unemployment or underemployment climate shocks as well. Um, in many places you can see um, political instability in some countries as well. I mean, this is maybe too much for our poor continent. Uh, two weeks ago, my guest on this program uh, was the World Bank Chief Economist for Africa, yes. Albert Zufak. And he told me that the global economic outlook still looks perplexed, means unstable, confused, and there is no well-defined margin because of COVID and the Ukrainian crisis. From an IMF perspective, how does the future look like? It's true that um, the global outlook remains very uncertain and the timing of it is very unfortunate because we just, we were thinking that with progress in terms of vaccination, and the fact that some countries were slowly abandoning lockdowns, we will go back to normalcy in a few years' time and seeing global trade resuming and with all the good spillover that we expect from it. But now with this shock, and again I said, it's very uncertain, this situation can be resolved tomorrow because it's highly political, or it cannot be resolved. We don't know what's going to happen. The situation can actually intensify. So that's why the stock market is crashing in many countries. That's why investors are very, very un, un, uh, unhappy. Well, and, uh, in, in, in the economic jargon, there is a, 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 a statement, especially with the financial markets, that markets don't like instability. Exactly. When, when this volatility continues like this, yes. who gets the greatest shock? The ordinary consumer or the policymaker? Very good question. Very good question, Charles. Usually, when there is a shock, the people who can cope with the shock are the people who have buffers. And in economic terms, what we call buffers are you have savings, you have liquid assets that you can transform quickly and you can use it to do whatever you want. Those people who ha do not have anything, the most vulnerable people, they are the one right now mostly affected by food and fuel prices. They are the ones who do not know if the price of their cocoa that they are producing will be X or Z. They have no idea. And in most cases, they are not even, they don't have access to banking services. So they cannot even borrow to cope with the, with the negative income shock. So clearly, when you see a shock like this, do not really worry about the rich. The rich will be fine. They have buffers. They can cope with the shock. We have to worry about the most vulnerable. They were already in trouble before this shock. They were slowly recovering from the COVID crisis with the huge recession that it caused in many countries. Now they're faced with these two um, main shock, oil and, and, and food prices, and it's very difficult for them. In countries that have social safety nets, in most advanced countries, we, they can use what we call automatic stabilizers. They can, because they have reserve currency, they can inject a lot you mean to in help. countries with social security schemes? Social security schemes, countries that issue reserve currency, I mean European countries with the Euro or the US, they can really send paycheck mm. to people at home. Like and they did during Like COVID. they did, and they can help. But for countries like our countries, we don't have very robust social safety nets. We rely a lot on interpersonal solidarity. This is our fabric, this is our social fabric. 
over the years, one of the means through which governments and policymakers and the advisors like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the International Corporation have asked them to do is constant borrowing to postpone uh, some of the debts and then uh, uh, repay them after. But when you look at Africa in particular, the debt ceiling today is roughly seven hundred billion dollars, an increase of roughly 300 plus in the past four years. Should we still go back to the IMF, the World Bank, to borrow again when most economies say that the debt ceiling is already no stable? The issue of debt um, should not be pol a polarizing issue. Debt is not always a bad thing. Right, you borrow from the future, but you want to invest I now. I understand that you are heading towards the yes quality of exactly of debt. Yes, but do you know that in most cases, especially in our economies, the issue of the quality of the debt has mm -hmm. always been an issue. That yes, where we spend the money. Yes, the, that's the why. Benefits, yeah. That's why when you borrow, the only thing you have to care about after you borrow is can this borrowing increase increase my gdp growth what stabilizes the debt to gdp over the time is gdp growth if you borrow and you do not grow you have ballooning effect and your debt becomes unsustainable so in many countries when they face with a negative shock it could be okay to borrow provided that your borrowing as you mentioned is within a framework where efficiency is at the maximum where you know where you're going to spend the money at where you know exactly how it's going to lift your activity or it's going to help the poorest. But if you borrow for things that are not productive, then you're going to face the problems. And you're going to end up in a situation where even your access to international market, including access to fund resources or World Bank resources, will be compromised. Because one thing that the IMF does before lending to a country is to make sure that our own lending is not going to destabilize your debt. And we encourage countries, poor countries like our country, Cameroon, to actually seek borrowing that is more on concessional terms. We know that given the fragility of our economy, given the need for this economy to grow even faster, it's better to have a debt that is not too expensive. If Cameroon start now to go on a spending spree and borrow and issue a lot of euro bonds, this situation at some point will run its course. Because to reimburse an expensive debt, you need to have a very robust GDP growth and robust domestic revenue mobilization. You work with the International Monetary Fund, which is like an advisory institution and a policymaker, a think tank in yes. economic matters and business. In situations like this, what do you provide as the best alternatives or advice to emerging economies? Something that is beautiful with the work that we, we do is, is that there is a dialogue with authorities. You know, the, 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 the IMF of 40 years ago is way different than the IMF today. So when we come to a country, we have to understand not only how the macroeconomy works in the country, but also how the political situation is developing, how inequality are developing in the country, how climate change is affecting countries, etc. So our advice to countries now takes into account all those aspects to provide the government with the best possible advice under specific circumstances. So when you see um, countries, African countries right now, we have multiple shocks that are happening at the same time. We are the continent that is not emitting a lot of CO2, but at the same time we are the continent that is affected the worst from due, due to climate change right so it's a shock that is coming on us that we didn't provoke second the covid pandemic is again a shock that came from abroad and hit our country hard because we didn't have robust health sectors we didn't have robust social safety net etc now we have this conflict happening in eastern europe again african countries have nothing to do with it but again we are importing this shock so this constant this constant knock-on effect of these global shocks on our economy is fragilizing our structure. That's why we have to make our economy more resilient than ever, because those shocks 
will come again. The world is moving into places that are very uncertain. You are simply telling the African markets and policymakers that possibly seize the opportunity of the African continental free trade area and build a very robust, resilient economic fabric which depends very, very much less on the European, Asian, and American markets. I'm, go I'm going to be very direct, yes, and why? When you look at demographic projections for Africa, our population will double by the end of 2050, 2060. We have the fast growing in terms of population continent. But the African youth population is about 340 million exactly. people. That is more than the US population. Combined. Exactly. If you think about Cameroon, Cameroon exports, main export markets are abroad, meaning in Europe and in Asia. If you take Nigeria, and you place Nigeria with other Central African countries, you go all the way to DRC, you include Rwanda. This population combined, the, what I call Central African population, including Nigeria, this population is way above the total population of European Union. So there is a market. There is a market that does not need sophisticated goods. If you can feed Nigeria, Imagine the spillover in terms of income for farmers in Cameroon. When you are in Kribi, you see Nigeria. Dr. Christian Ebeke, thank you very much indeed for being guest on Globe Watch. It was a pleasure, Charles. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome.